Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those here in the sanctuary and those who are online with us today. I was just watching as folks gathered on Zoom, and it's really great to be able to see your faces as well. First Church is a progressive Christian community that gathers to listen, speak, and act in a spirit of compassion, justice, and stewardship. Wherever you find yourself on your journey of life and faith, you're welcome here. If you're visiting today, please know we'd love to connect with you. You can fill out a card in the pew or visit our website, firstchurchmn.org, and sign our guest book. If you have a prayer concern today, please write it on the sheet in the back that's with the ushers, or place it into the chat, and we will be sure to pray with you. And now, please place your feet firmly on the ground. And let us acknowledge that this land is the sacred homeland of the Dakota people, and is also home to the Ojibwe and Ho-Chunk peoples. And let us confess that the settler ancestors of this church stole this land that the church has been complicit in colonization and genocide, in white supremacy in all its forms. And let us ask the Spirit to guide us as we work to repair this harm and to create a future of greater justice. As we worship together today, may the peace of Christ be with you all. So as we have throughout the summer, we'll take a little bit of time for conversation, for connecting with each other. Our prompt today is, what helps you find rest and renewal? So, go.
You think of God resting after the creation was finally all created. You think of the deep hush of it, like the hush between breakers at the beach. You think of the new creation itself resting, the gray squirrels ceasing to twitch and chatter, the kingfisher settling down on the branch by the pond, the man and the woman standing still in the garden. You think of God blessing this one day of the seven and hallowing it, making it holy. The room is quiet. You're not feeling tired enough to sleep or energetic enough to go out. For the moment, there is nowhere else you'd rather go, no one else you'd rather be. You feel at home in your body. You feel at peace in your mind. For no particular reason, you let the palms of your hands come together and close your eyes. Sometimes it is only when you happen to taste a crumb of it that you dimly realize what it is that you're so hungry for, you can hardly bear it. Our passage from Isaiah addresses the Israelite community returning home from exile. 
Rebuilding the temple and the city was moving slowly. Leadership was contested. Drought, food shortages, and economic and social inequity threatened the stability and identity of the community. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9b to 14. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and God will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Jesus' healing in today's story becomes an occasion for a debate about the purpose of the Sabbath. In Jewish scripture and tradition, one strand of Sabbath observance emphasizes the idea of rest. The other defines Sabbath as a day for liberation from every form of bondage. Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, are you set free? You are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of God for God's people. May God bless us with insight and a generous understanding. Grace and peace to you, friends in Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In about 1820, Martin Fugate immigrated to the United States from France. He married Elizabeth Smith. 
and they settled near Hazard, Kentucky. It turns out that these two people were both unexpectedly carriers of a rare recessive gene that turns people's blood and skin blue. Many of their descendants shared this condition, and collectively they became known as the Blue People of Kentucky. The disorder, the blood disorder, can cause serious problems, heart abnormalities and seizures, but most of the time it does not. The vast majority of these people with blue skin lived long and healthy lives. Their condition remained a mystery for more than a century until eventually researchers identified the gene and developed a treatment. In her novel, The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek, Kim Michelle Richardson imagines the life of Cussie Mary Carter in the 1930s in that same area of Kentucky. She's the last of her kind, the only remaining person with blue skin besides her pa. Around town, everyone calls Cussie Mary by the nickname Bluet. Though her pa hopes for her to be married, books are Bluet's passion. She's thrilled when she's chosen to join the Pack Horse Library Project, administered by the Works Progress Administration. She spends her days traveling the remote Appalachian country on her mule, Junia, delivering reading material to her neighbors. Though some of them are literally starving to death, their hunger for education is as great as their longing for food. The town physician, Doc, desperately wants to study Bluett and her paw. One day they find themselves in terrible danger because of their color, and they are forced to accept Doc's help and protection. In exchange, he takes Bluett to the big city for testing. At the hospital, a terrified Bluett is wrestled to the ground and sedated, humiliated and violated. She recalls waking up afterward. I'm sorry the nurses were rough with you, Bluett, Doc said. But it was very important. Very. And we'll learn soon about your family's blood and how we can fix it. Fix you, my dear. I felt a spark of anger slip behind my eyes, prompting a headache. What I most wanted was to be okay as a blue. I never understood why other people thought my color, any color, needed fixing. It'll be wonderful to fix you, won't it? Fix. Again, the chilling word caught in my throat and I suddenly wished Mama had fixed my birth with some of her bitter herbs. Then I would have never had to suffer this horrid curse of the blueness. Still, Doc said it would be wonderful and I couldn't help but wonder what my pa and my's life would be like if we were fixed. The confused thoughts made my head pound harder. The story and the voice of Cussie Mary strikes me as a good companion to today's gospel story. This pairing keeps us honest about the complexities of healing. Cussie Mary's quote-unquote illness is socially constructed in the sense that she would have been perfectly happy and healthy with blue skin if it were not for the mean-spirited exclusion and violent persecution she endured at the hands of her neighbors. And the quote-unquote cure that Doc offers is awful. It's dehumanizing and ultimately unnecessary. Of course, sometimes we are sick and we need and want healing. But we want that support and that help without stigma, without shame. The whole idea that anyone needs to be fixed under any circumstances is deeply problematic. 
What we want, as Blewett puts it, is to be okay, as we are. Or to paraphrase Frederick Buechner, to feel at home in our bodies and at peace in our minds. There are two interconnected themes in today's gospel story, healing and the Sabbath. What is at the heart of both and what ties them together is the notion of liberation. The woman in the story was able to stand up straight for the first time in 18 years. This changing of posture, though, was not simply about her physical capabilities. It was a visible sign of a spiritual and social reality. She was set free. And her liberation was not something that happened to just her in isolation. This liberation changed the community as much as it changed her. Jesus' healing ministry freed others to relate to this woman differently. It seems to me that the synagogue leader's interest in objecting to the woman's healing was mostly to oppose Jesus. For whatever reason, he thought it was his job to be a gatekeeper and a rule setter. He needed to be in control of how and when healing happened. I would guess he didn't think about this woman at all. He simply saw the chance to nail Jesus on a technicality. No work on the Sabbath, and healing is work. Gotcha. Jesus reminded the leader of something he surely already knew, that the Sabbath commandment in Jewish tradition is not tied just to the story of creation, the seventh day on which God rested. It is also rooted in the story of the Exodus. The book of Deuteronomy contends that the whole point of Sabbath is to allow everyone to rest. The elites can rest whenever they want. They don't need a Sabbath day. The commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 5 specifies those who should have at least one day off a week, not only sons and daughters, but also those who are easily exploited, slaves, livestock, and resident aliens. Remember, verse 15 urges, you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The prophet Isaiah's words about the Sabbath strike a similar note. When the prophet called out those who went their own way and served their own interests on the Sabbath, he was criticizing the decision some made to enrich themselves through forcing others to labor without rest. Refraining from trampling the Sabbath means refraining from trampling the personhood, the dignity, and the health of our neighbors. The prophet argues that the well-being of each member of the community is linked to the well-being of the community as a whole. As the Jewish-American poet Emma Lazarus said, until we are all free, we are none of us free. Isaiah promises that the community that puts an end to oppression will experience abundant and vibrant life. If you remove the yoke from among you, the prophet declares, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. The Sabbath commandment envisions a world of liberation a society in which everyone, even the poorest and the most vulnerable, experience rest, renewal, and delight, have time and space to enjoy life, contemplate the beauty of the earth, and commune with God. And that Sabbath vision is the basis for Jesus' ministry of healing. There's one aspect of this story that bugs me, and maybe it bugs you too, 
If healing is not about treating people like objects that need to be fixed, and if healing is about seeing and honoring each other's dignity, if healing means that we can be okay as we are, that we can feel at home in our bodies and at peace in our minds, if healing is systemic, if it sets us free from oppression, if it makes the community well and whole, if healing is liberation, then why didn't Jesus ask the woman if she wanted to be healed? Maybe Jesus made a mistake. Maybe he had a blind spot. I don't personally need Jesus to be perfect in order for his ministry to hold the blessing of God. However, I believe that healing is a dialogue, a respectful dialogue between God and us. When God offers healing, when God invites us into a different way of being, God always leaves room for us to choose. It is our right to refuse. And if we want healing, it is our responsibility to actively receive it. So I think, in a way, the woman did agree to be healed. Her actions suggest consent. She did not stay bent over. She stood up. She looked everyone in the eye. She did not remain silent. She found her voice. She began praising God. You could even say she became a leader in the spiritual life of her community. Friends, we talked last week about what kind of time it is in the life of our church. We are feeling tension about all the change we have experienced. Many of us are a bit fuzzy-headed, uncertain about who we are now in this world and how we can contribute. We are processing a lot of grief and we are coping with diminished energy and of course, we are not alone. These struggles are clearly present in our larger world. Everywhere I look, I see tension, confusion, stress, exhaustion, the sense of being pushed to the limits of our endurance. I see it in people's dangerous driving, in the polarization of our politics, in the oppressive and inhumane working conditions that make it necessary now for nurses to threaten a strike. Someone suggested to me recently, given what time it is, maybe we could focus on Sabbath this year, on rest, renewal, and replenishment. And if we were to do that, I think we would need to start with ourselves while resisting the tunnel vision that focuses only on our own needs. What could Sabbath look like in your life? in the life of First Church? Is there some kind of change, even a small one, that could offer liberation? What does God's invitation to receive healing look like, sound like, feel like to you? And how will you respond to that? And then what might you do, what might we do together to honor the biblical vision of Sabbath as the basis for a healthy and just society? How are we being called to contribute to the possibility that everyone can be at home and at peace? That everyone can access spaces of rest and healing, liberation, and agency. Amen.
Let us pray. Liberating God, we give thanks for all the ways you offer us healing and invite us to become agents of healing for others. Lead us toward a world in which all of us are free. With Hikaru, we offer prayers for Jamie, whose mother died, for the Cody family, whose no baby is ill and fighting for his life, for Jill and Josh as they grieve the death of Josh's mother, for Courtney, who had a death in the family, for Mary, who recently lost her sister, for Michaela and her husband as they welcome their baby girl and for Hikaru as she holds all that community in her heart. We offer prayers of thanks for Andrea, who's visiting today. God, in your love. We offer prayers of courage for Gia as she moves on Tuesday for college in Boston. God, in your blessing. Shannon has kindly offered a prayer of gratitude for me on my birthday. <laughs> and gratitude for who I am in the world and the gifts I bring. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. God, in your love. We remember today those beloved ones who have died, especially Mary Stearns Anderson, Jean Anderson's mother, who died on August 27th. God, in your memory. We pray for nurses and for those they are negotiating with. May they find a way to provide better working conditions that will support the health of us all. We give thanks for the return of burial land to the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe by the city of Superior. We pray for the people of Mogadishu, Somalia, after 20 people died in a shooting in a hotel there. God, in your mercy and justice. We pray now in silence, trusting in God, who hears the cries and the hopes of creation. And let us pray with the words and in the spirit of Jesus. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And with Mary Byers, we offer prayers of healing and comfort for nine-year-old Ezra and his family. Ezra suffered a head injury and may lose his left eye. God, in your compassion. At this time, I invite your gifts to support the ministry of First Church and also our special offering for August which supports our, um, our Neighbors at Mercy School. We work with the organization Every Meal um, and partner with other congregations in our area to ensure that uh, kids and their families have food on the weekends. You can place a gift for either purpose in the um, offering plate as you leave the sanctuary today, or you can make a gift at our website. Just click on the Give button and 
it should be clear how to proceed. Thank you for your generous lives. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Healing God, we will be faithful to the renewing practice of Sabbath, seeking liberation for ourselves and for all creation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We have a few announcements. We're planning for community night on September 7th which is a chance to reach out to our neighbors around us and especially to the students who are moving in right now. We'll be collaborating with our friends from the community kitchen 
um, who will help us offer a baked potato bar as well as some sweets and some plants for people's apartments. So if you can bring some sweets or some plants, that's very welcome. If you can help with um, cooking that afternoon or with setting up and serving the, the food, that would be great. There's a sign-up sheet in the back, or you can email me and let me know what, what you'd like to do. In our fall worship, we're going to be focusing on parables that Jesus told from the Gospel of Luke. And the worship team is looking to create a more of a sense of dialogue with these stories. So we invite you to participate by creating a scripture introduction in your own voice, in kind of a different voice than the usual, something a bit more personal. We just want you to think about what do you love about the scripture? What do you hate about it? What do you find confusing? What are you curious about? And hopefully I'll be able to prepare my sermons with your thoughts in mind. So please let me know if you're up for trying this for a Sunday during the fall. We'd love to have a, a bunch of different people involved in this way. Today at about 11.20, the Faith Formation team is meeting. Um, the purpose of this team is to plan and coordinate activities that help us explore spiritual commitments and perspectives. So please join us if you'd like to be part of doing that. We'll be meeting here in the sanctuary, and you can also join on Zoom. The link is in the chat if you're online today. Um, Byron, I wondered if you wanted to say a word about choir? Thanks. Yeah, so remember the choir? We have had a long musical drought in that respect, and I'm delighted to say that uh, the return of the choir is just uh, around the corner. Um, I will be sending out an announcement in the chime soon, and I will be reaching out to anyone in the congregation who's interested in joining or rejoining the choir and dusting off the <laughs> our, our disused vocal cords and getting ourselves back into shape and um, restoring a really valuable and important part of this community. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to, uh, to, to restart this process. So the, uh, the current plan is for us to begin rehearsals the Wednesday after Labor Day, which I believe would be the 7th of September. That's the same day as the baked potato event, and so I'm hoping people will show up and starch up and then uh, <laughs> uh, come on over and start singing with us, and we will start slow and look at some familiar pieces and favorites and um, just enjoy the process of being together and singing. We will, of course, be singing with masks uh, as we are doing in the congregational singing. Um, so bring your own high quality mask or I will make some available um, at, at rehearsals. Um, I imagine that our first Sunday then would be on the 11th, uh, assuming that <laughs> uh, we have adequate representation on the 7th and something to prepare. So. Please uh, give that some real discernment. I, I hope that is as exciting to you as it is to me. And I'm looking forward to um, sharing um, with the choir uh, all the musical gifts that, that they bring to this church and I know has been long overdue. So um, I'm looking forward to it.
forth now in peace, listening for God's invitations to be set free, to be healed, to know deep Sabbath rest. Amen. Amen. 